So our next speaker today is Stefan Schumacher. Hi, Stefan. Uh, he'll be discussing uh, um, issues of uh, intelligence, probably um, alternative intelligence of intrusion detection systems, and how this has to do with the, the, the reliability of IDSs. Yeah, so I welcome you to my uh, talk. Um, the topic is the developmental psychology of intrusion detection systems. Um, first, I would like to introduce myself. I'm currently studying educational science and psychology at the University of Magdeburg in Germany. Um, some years ago, I once studied computer science and electrical engineering, but quit it. And um, in 2004, I wrote um, a short article about intrusion detection systems, and I'm still interested in that stuff. Um, nowadays, I'm focusing on social engineering security awareness, and I do some research on organizational security, so I may have a different point of view on security than um, a computer scientist or a hacker. So um, this is more or less a um, scientific talk, so I will give no answers but raise more questions. Um, what is the background of that uh, talk? Um, the topics of um, psychology and intrusion detection systems sounds a little bit strange, but um, it works well if you think that every intrusion or security in, uh, incident has a social dimension. Um, to detect or prevent security incidents, the social dimension has to be analyzed. You cannot get along only with, with a technology-only model. Um, preventing security incidents means you have to anticipate future events. That means you have to predict the behavior at a future point in time. So from the behavior of someone at the, at na, at the point of time uh, in a, in a, in a, sorry, my tongue. <laughs> you have to try to predict um, the future behavior of someone from the behavior he is currently showing. This is called a prob probabilistic decision in psychology and philosophy, which, which means that um, this decision is not um, very stable or has not to be very stable or very um, safe. It is always with some kind of, of insecurity. Um, to make such a decision, you need diagnostic and prognostic competences and social intelligence. Um, in philosophy, you would call this uh, cognitive faculty or gnosis, which is the Greek term for that. Um, and um, these competencies are the core competencies of psychology and especially psychiatry. So I thought it might be interesting to show the psychologist's point of view onto that topic. Um, there are currently some interesting research projects going on beyond computer science. Um, there was a large school shooting in March in Germany and uh, uh, a 16-year-old boy killed, I guess, 12 people. And um, now there is a project going on at the University of Berlin that wants to prevent school shootings and identify potential school shooters. And that can be considered to be some kind of intrusion detection too. Um, the interesting discussion about that project was that the police and some politicians tried to uh, turn schools into prisons with uh, fences and, and such. And uh, most of the teachers said that doesn't work. We have to um, use more psychologists and psychiatrists and try to prevent or try to analyze the behavior of students. There is another project going on um, about analyzing surveillance cameras or the data from surveillance cameras to identify potential terrorists. Um, the idea behind that is that a computer program is uh, being developed that is analyzing the pictures and try to analyze the behavior of human beings. And based on that, um, it shall give a decision if someone is uh, a terrorist or maybe a robot or, or something like that. Um, there's also, of course, research being done for several years in criminal prognosis and criminology, which is also part of psychology and psychiatry. Um, I, uh, or from a philosophical point of view, you have to um, think about decisions and decision making. Um, Heinz von Förster, who is from Austria originally, um, made um, a so-called metaphysical postulate. He said um, there are two kinds of decisions that can be made. Those who already have been made and those who cannot be made. The first uh, kind of decision is, uh, or are decisions usually made in, in nature science, like physics, biology or such. For example, um, is the Earth the center of the universe? This is a decision that has not to be made by mankind. We just have to um, discover if the Earth or the Sun is the center of our uh, universe. So uh, at one point in time, 
the geocentric model was um, considered to be the one and only model of universe, but um, after some time it was overwritten by the heliocentric model. And this is usually the um, uh, core of the um, scientific philosophy of natural science. Um, the second kind of decision, those who cannot be made, are decisions like, should gay marriage be allowed? This is something you can debate of, uh, but you cannot uh, say um, that decision is true and that decision is false. It is something um, you will never uh, uh, come to, a, or you can, you can only come to a conclusion, but you can never find um, a natural uh, cause for that conclusion. So, um, re with, uh, with regards to intrusion detection of computer science, um, the verification of a computer program, the theoretical, mathematical ver verification um, of a computer program is um, a decision that already has been made. So either the computer program is free of errors or it has some errors. And um, for example, if you check for buffer overflows, uh, or the check for buffer overflows can be automated because you can write a program that checks a computer program for such kind of um, uh, errors. Um, the second kind of decision applies to human behavior. For example, if the current behavior mistakes is showing just friendly, or is he trying uh, social engineering? So is he trying to attack me, or is he just a, a nice person that holds the door open for me? And this one cannot be automated. The second uh, decision cannot be made by a computer because a computer is not able to, to do a debate. A computer is a deterministic automaton and is only able to conduct those uh, kind of, of uh, decision. So now I would like to uh, switch over to the developmental psychology. Um, the developmental psychology was mainly influenced by a Swiss biologist called Jean Piaget. Um, he was born in 1896 and died in 1980. And his main research topic was how humans generate cognition. So um, he analyzed uh, children, especially his own uh, three daughters, and he analyzed the development of children. And he created a theory that is called genetic epistemology and which influenced not only um, psychology, but also philosophy, social science, and um, a lot of other um, fields of uh, science. Um, he described the developmental steps of children, and he described the development of the mind of children. So how are people uh, developing social intelligence? When are people or human beings able to interpret um, social behavior? So my idea is now to use the genetic uh, epistemology to create a theory of intrusion detection that offers diagnostic and prognostic competences, social intelligence, and cognitive faculty. Um, the genetic concept was introduced mainly by uh, Darwin. Uh, he introduced the concept of development as um, evolution or epigenetics, as it's called in biology. Um, any kind of evolution is a process that builds new structures and attributes from indifferent genes, so new capabilities are developed. Um, evolution has no determinable beginning and no defined end. Um, in psychology, we uh, do research on the field of ontogenesis, which means the evolution of one human being, so from birth or gestation to the death of one uh, man, but we also do um, phylogenesis, which means the evolution of one um, phylum or phylum. That means uh, the whole mankind. So how did the mankind develop from 2000 before Christ up to now? And this um, model of phylogenesis could also be used to describe um, the evolution of science. For example, we could say um, the scientific progress is uh, some kind of um, evolution that started with uh, maybe a Ptolemy in Old Greek and now uh, went over from Einstein to uh, Max Planck and so on. Um, the main or the central uh, theoretical concept of the genetic epistemology of Piaget is the structure. Um, the structure is the nucleus of development and it predetermines the direction of any development. The uh, structure it has been inspired by the biological concept of holism. Um, holism means that... Um, an wait. Oh, okay, there is a, another uh, slide about holism. Um, that um, idea of holism led to the genetic psychology and the cybernetic theory of equilibration, which I will describe in, a, in another slide. Um, structures are used to describe cognition via general forms. So Piaget was not interested in describing um, 
a specific cognition, but he was interested in describing how cognition is made or how cognition works and how people or maybe uh, even machines are able to generate some cognition competences. And those uh, structures are used to describe how cognition is organized. Um, Pierre Jay, as a biologist, viewed the human mind as some kind of organism um, which is different, differentiated from the environment. So the organism of the human mind lives in an environment, but it is differentiated from it, uh, but it also interacts with it. So the human mind does not exist in, a, in some kind of um, vacuum, but it exists in an interaction with other people, with um, the world, and so on. Structures are, in a um, general definition, systems of interrelations between the elements and between the elements and the whole. So we have interactions within our mind and our mind interacts with the world and the environment. Structures are non-static, that means they are able to develop and they are self-organizing. So actually we do not um, organize our structures, but the structures organize us. So our mind is created or organized by the structures itself. Um, this led to the conclusion that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So uh, cognition is more than just the sum of single perceptions. The cognition of a human mind is more than uh, things I'm seeing or things I'm hearing. Um, a structure can be used on thinking and world, so I can use a structure to describe how thinking works, and I can use a structure on how to describe uh, something uh, in a world works. For example, we can build a structure of the DeepSec conference. It works on mind and matter, so therefore we can also um, describe the interaction between cognition and reality. Um, each structure is just a momentum of an uncompleted and uncompletable process of construction. So uh, we cannot say that uh, a human mind or a structure at one point in time is, is ready and there will be no further development. There will always be further development for any structure that is um, available. Um, he was then um, asking or wondering how structures are created or updated. Um, the basic structures uh, are created by hardware, for example, the brain. Each um, newborn uh, child um, has functions its brain is capable to do. And um, for an IDS or computer, it would be, for example, the CPU. Um, um, a digital alpha has another structure than an, an, an Intel Pentium or uh, another uh, computer uh, CPU. Um, structures are used to assimilate objects, but objects can also acc accommodate structures. So assimilation is um, a function where subjective structures are used on objects which are assimilated into the structures. So whenever uh, I approach a new object, I have to, uh, or my, my, uh, my uh, structures assimilate that object into so. So when I first see a new fruit, for example a banana, I have to find out what it is, how I have to eat it, um, uh, how it tastes and so on. But each, uh, each uh, uh, assimilation uh, is mutually dependent to accommodation. Accommodation is the vice versa process where the object uh, influences the structure. So um, when I'm first seeing uh, something new, um, this new object is also influencing the structures or my mental representation of the world. Um, each action a human being is, is doing invokes assimilation and accommodation. So we cannot live without that. And whenever we are doing something, these processes uh, are going on. And uh, perception is usually organized, uh, or perception is organizing external events with existing perception structures. So, so for example, um, if you're colorblind, you cannot see red and green uh, letters or uh, you cannot uh, determine if the traffic light is currently flashing green or red. So the, your uh, mental representation of the world or of the reality is influenced strictly by those structures available by your brain. Um, these are some, um, some pictures I used um, for human development. For example, the first structure uh, any human being has to develop is a structure of uh, crawling or scrabbling, and once you are able to, to crawl, you can start uh, walking upright. And when you are able to walk upright, you can then start to, for example, ride a bike, and then maybe you can take um, lessons in ballet dancing. But you cannot strictly go direct, or you cannot go directly from scrawling to ballet dancing, because the structure of walking upright is not yet developed. So um, this is some uh, example for a development process. 
Um, another interesting point is, uh, especially for psychologists and teachers, um, about learning motivation. Why are people interested in learning, or why should people learn? Um, Piaget has no explicit motivational theory, um, but he says that um, the structures should be kept equilibrated. So um, he says equilibrated structures are failure resistant. There is no failure possible within these structures. And non-equilibrated structures cause a cognitive conflict within the mind of a human being. He did not describe why or how this um, conflict uh, happens, but he just said um, that it happens. And once it happens, any human being is interested in um, bringing the structures back into an equilibrated uh, point. That means that structures are liberated step by step. So going back to the pictures, you can see um, that, for example, um, that child still has to learn how to use um, his leg or her legs to, to uh, walk upwards. And um, this is uh, done by equilibrating the structure of movement. So um, each higher structure is more comprehensive than its predecessor. Um, Piaget also said that um, cognition is more than just collecting data. So it's not about collecting data and putting it into a database, but it's also about um, using reflection and construction to create new structures. So um, people have to reflect about the structures they are using and how they are influencing uh, experience and cognition. For example, uh, each individual um, attending the DeepSec conference will have its own point of view about the conference because the personal biography is influencing the way how you're seeing this conference. Uh, once you've uh, done or once a reflection has started, um, new structures can be built. And uh, any developmental process is influenced by older structures. So um, the biography of any human being influences the learning uh, process of any new task. Um, the um, consequences are that um, epistemology will lead to at least some kind of identity. That means um, each IDS will be unique. So in case you are able to program an intrusion detection system that um, is able to really learn, um, it will generate some kind of, of, of own identity. So if you uh, deploy an intrusion detection system maybe on the network of Google and another one on the network of Microsoft, and after some time, both IDS um, will have some kind of unique identity and they are not comparable anymore. Um, that means that the IDS of Google might detect an intrusion when uh, which uh, the IDS of Microsoft might not be able to uh, detect. So that would mean you, uh, or we will require some kind of asset diagnostics on IDS because uh, learnable IDS are no longer comparable to each other. Um, for example, if you, if you take a simple virus scanner, which is uh, using uh, just text scanning to, to detect a virus, you can say that a virus scanner with uh, a lexicon or a dictionary of one million viruses is better than a, a virus scanner with a dictionary of 1,000 viruses. But um, this is not possible to say about an IDS that is learnable, because uh, you cannot say or, or see if an IDS already has learned to detect uh, one attack. So. Uh, uh, we would need um, assessment centers or, or, or uh, asset tests to make a diagnostic if an IDS is working or not, or if an IDS might be able to detect an intrusion. Um, being an epistemic IDS uh, means also that it might be able to detect new attacks, or as the psychologists say, it has the learning potential to learn the skills required to detect attacks. It does not say that it will develop these skills. Um, even um, if an IDS is, is able to learn, it might fail at, detectic, uh, at detecting an attack or an intrusion. Um, so now I'd like to leave the PLJ universe and go back to, to learning. Um, what is, um, or in my opinion, real learning is required to achieve proficiency and ID. Uh, with real learning, um, I mean a more psychological definition of learning and not a computer science definition, or uh, the definitions currently used by computer science. Uh, one point uh, each and every psychologist would say is true is that learning always requires a feedback loop. So uh, one cannot learn from an unidentified attack. So it is not able to to, to uh, create um, a program or to train a human being to learn from an attack that has not been already already identified. 
So we cannot identify, or it is not possible to, to automatically identify new attacks or currently unknown attacks. So we still have um, the diagnostical problem of uh, predicting the future. Um, I would like to give just a short example about that from learning theory. Um, one of the oldest, uh, older learning theories is um, so-called behaviorism. It has been influenced by Pavlov, uh, who made the experiments with his uh, dogs about uh, operant conditioning. He um, rang a bell and gave um, the dogs some food, and when he then only rang the bell, the dogs uh, started to uh, uh, the dogs reacted on, uh, they wanted their food because they're um, hmm? cruel? Cool. Uh, started to salvate, yeah, they started to salvate, though. Um, Skinner, an American biologist, made some experiments with rats, cats, and dogs on so-called operant conditioning. Um, he used um, rats, uh, put them into his so-called Skinner box, and um, he taught them how to, uh, or he uh, installed several buttons in the cage, and when they pushed the right button, they got some food, and after some time, they learned which button is the right, and so they pressed on the buttons and got more food and food. And from that um, experiment, he created his theory of learning, which was later turned into the theory of cybernetics by uh, Norbert Wiener. And cybernetics um, also influenced uh, mechanical science and physics. But uh, the problem is, and uh, that's the reason why behaviorism was later dropped, um, they consider learning to be a simple stimulus response mechanism. But a simple stimulus response mechanism um, is very easy to be programmed. So each computer is able to, to react like that. Each, each computer program is a stimulus response mechanism. So the, um, the, the, the mechanism is described in these um, five points. Teach the information, give the student a book, or um, give the computer some kind of, of new data, give the learner time to understand. Um, the behaviorism does not explain how learning actually works. Um, then um, the, the teacher should ask a question on the subject taught to determine if the student already has understand the subject. And then you have to give, or the, the um, teacher has to give feedback based on the quality of the reaction of the student. So we still have that, the, that um, feedback loop. So whenever a learning process has to be started, we need uh, some kind of feedback. And each and every intrusion detection system or each and every human being interested in um, learning about attacks has to get that feedback reaction. So there has to be already an analysis of the intrusion. So we cannot, or the, the human being or the computer cannot learn uh, from a totally new attack no one knows of. So uh, learning means we have to analyze uh, an attack or an intrusion, and then we can try to, to create a didactics of, uh, or didactics of intrusion uh, at, and attacks, and then we can try to use it uh, to teach those um, events happened. But we cannot um, create or, or um, develop uh, some machine or uh, train people to uh, learn from events not yet analyzed. Uh, this is a model of a working ideas and training in my point of view. Uh, so my conclusion or currently working um, hypothesis in research are um, security is a social problem. Security is not only a problem of a technological dimension or a problem of computer programs or a problem of virus scanner or, or monitoring network traffic. Uh, in my opinion, only humans are able to detect intrusions. Only human beings have currently the skills and abilities to, uh, to think about uh, future events and to try to give a prognosis or diagnosis of an event. Computers can make no decisions or at least no decisions of the second kind. Um, computers are just tools. We can use computers as a great tool to enhance security, but computers alone are not able to generate security. Um, security is a dimension of organizational culture. So um, I guess more organizational research has to be done. For example, um, knowledge management has been researched quite uh, quite good by computer science, economy, psychology, and social science. And um, some of the uh, results of knowledge management could perfectly be used um, on um, organizational security. So how should uh, the organizational culture be uh, influenced to um, 
stimulate people to think about computer security, think about security awareness or such. Um, security awareness is, is only working when the organizational culture is supporting awareness and it's uh, supporting learning by the inv individual and organizational learning. And um, we currently have no no theory of organizational security. Um, I would like to, to create uh, or at least try to develop some such kind of uh, theory uh, where security is um, viewed from the organizational point of view, from the from from a more upper level than just the technological view. I would like to leave um, the level where only uh, TCP/IP packets are analyzed or some cryptographical signature signatures are, are viewed. And I would like to also um, include uh, human beings, human behavior, human actions, uh, philosophy, and of course, um, um, more or less a theory of um, of organizational structures. So. Once again, from my current experience as, as an, uh, uh, someone who is uh, conducting security awareness campaigns, um, those structures or structures established in, within an organization give the possibilities to uh, create an organizational culture with a security aware, but the structure alone does not create security awareness. It just gives the possibility for the human beings to become security aware. So, Okay, faster than thought. Um, questions, discussions, or was it too esoteric for you, or too philosophical, or? Yes? Okay. Traffic anomaly. Traffic anomaly. Ah, um, is from. It, is it coming close to the, what you're talking about? <laughs> um, yes, on a, on a, maybe on another level. So um, I guess an anomaly detection already uh, also has a diagnostical problem. So if you already know what kind of anomaly is uh, an intrusion, you can perfectly write a computer program that works that. But if you do not know which anomaly uh, will lead to an, an, an attack or is an attack, you, you cannot um, analyze it and you cannot, uh, cannot uh, react on it or prevent it. So this philosophical questions uh, I rose are applying to any kind of intrusion detection. And uh, what I try to set is that some levels can perfectly be uh, worked by computers. For example, uh, traffic anomaly. That, that's uh, the perfect work for computer. But um, on the organizational point or from a higher level, you also have to include human beings. There was Any more questions? Um, uh, many of the questions you raised in, in, or you raised in this presentation were I think in the late 1980s or early 1990s, uh, uh, I've been reported regarding these expert systems, decision-making systems, yes. and uh, where do you um, defer those systems? Because I think the research on that fell kind of asleep in the last years. So I haven't, I haven't heard a lot about that. Uh, where do you differentiate those uh, from IDS systems? <sighs> That's that's an interesting question. Um, I could uh, I, I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm doing some studying on, on uh, knowledge management, and we also have uh, these uh, topics there too. Um, when we have um, a lecture at university, we usually have uh, psychologists, computer scientists, and economists in these lectures, and they are also the same same discussions about that. So um, I think from a technical point of view. They might work on several problems, but uh, what I have to say, they are also just tools, and they have to be used by some kind of organization, some kind of, of, of uh, strategy and, and, and human beings. So um, um, a lot of these points that have to, be, have to be discussed here by um, organizational security research have already been discussed in knowledge management, decision making, and such. And uh, like with traffic uh, anomaly detection, it works on some problems, but it works on others not. And, uh, there is also um, the, the run between, uh, how, how Clausewitz uh, said in his book on war, there is always a run between the sword and the shield. So once you develop a strategy to defend something, an attacker will defend, uh, an attacker will uh, create a strategy to attack it. Um, there was an example, um, I read a book about the um, Israeli uh, El Al uh, airline. They used trained psychologists at the airports uh, to look out for potential terrorists. So they stand there and they had some kind of, of checklist who might be a potential Palestinian or Arabian uh, terrorist. 
And um, they looked, for example, f to um, those um, um, Palestinian or Arabians who had uh, beards because they are forced by their Quran to have a beard. And once the Palestinian terror organizations realized that they were looking for men with beard, they tried, uh, uh, the, the terrorists shaved and wore uh, a business suit. And uh, so um, the LR fixed uh, the checklist and said, okay, also look out for business uh, suits and, and shaved Palestinians. And once um, the Palestinians realized that, they used women because um, the Israeli uh, defense forces and LR didn't expect women to carry bombs. And so they had some kind of, of run and that um, from a strategic point of view will also happen to any kind of, of defense technology. Okay. So anyone, anyone interested in um, developing a strategy on, on uh, defense should read uh, Clausewitz on war. It has been written in the 18th century by a German uh, colonel and it's giving a lot of, of still working uh, hints on developing a strategy. Do we have any further questions? No. Okay. okay. So if you're Thank interested, you so if, you have, if you have further questions or uh, suggestions, feel free to contact me. I also have business cards here. Um, I'm, like I said, interested in doing more research on that. So maybe we could, uh, could get in contact. Okay. Thanks.